Hello, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome back to this truly amazing global symposium. Uh, I'm Gavin Lindbergh, and I have the honor of moderating um, this next session entitled When Treatment Doesn't Go to Plan. Uh, I'm joining you from my home uh, here in Maryland, um, in the U.S., just outside of Washington, D.C. And just by way of quick introduction, um, I want to share that I'm here today because my wife, Wendy, and I lost our only child, Evan, to endemic amplified elk mutated neuroblastoma in 2010. Now, our son was seven years old when he passed, and he waged a four-year battle that defined courage after being diagnosed at the age of three. And his mom and I continue the fight against this horrible disease uh, in his memory through our nonprofit organization, the Evan Foundation. And it's really an honor uh, to be a part of this program today and particularly excited about this panel. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have a world-class panel of experts um, with us to discuss the extremely important topic of how to approach relapse and refractory disease. And um, our panel today, you'll hear presentations from Dr. John Maris, Dr. Pablo Berlanga, Dr. Kate Mathay, and Laura Weberling. Um, and the, the discussion from uh, those four individuals should take about an hour. And then I expect that we'll have about 45 minutes uh, at the end uh, to take your questions. And I think folks just watching the sessions earlier are familiar um, with how to submit questions. You can do so anonymously if you choose. I would just ask that um, please remember that the panel cannot take questions that relate to specific, uh, specific circumstances of specific cases uh, and patients. So um, with that said, I know folks want to hear from the panel and not necessarily me. So let's move forward uh, with our first speaker, uh, Dr. John Maris. John doesn't really need an introduction uh, to this group. He's been a principal leader in the neuroblastoma community for over three decades now, both in the clinic and in the lab. Uh, John is a friend who took care of my son at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, and I know for a fact that he's double booked right now, so we're lucky to have him. So, John, let me turn the floor over to you for your presentation on overcoming refractory disease. Well, thank you very much, Gavin. Um, and uh, yes, I do very much apologize, but I am presently co-hosting a uh, meeting at the NCI and um, the magic of Zoom, I was able to sneak out for a couple of hours. I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss the rest of the conference. Um, this is a daunting topic to talk about. And so I, I'm keeping my comments purposely brief um, uh, so that uh, we have plenty of time for discussion because really this meeting is for you. And I think it'd really be nice to try to hear from you and try to address your specific questions. I have a disclosure at the bottom that I, is important. Um, uh, I'm very lucky to be practicing at a very well-resourced hospital. And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is afforded by the fact that we have resources to do um, uh, cutting edge genetic testing. And I'm fully cognizant of the fact that many of you may be from areas of the world that are less well off in terms of resources. Um, and I just want you to know that many of the things that we'll talk about today may be very difficult for um, some of your physicians to deal with, but we are trying very, very hard to any advances that we make uh, to uh, develop new tests and assays that are more uh, broadly applicable, applicable across the globe. So, you know, I, I often start with just definitions because it, it, it helps. And I think that there's a lot of words here from Miriam Webster that, you know, this term refractory. Um, uh, there's a lot of words here that I think many of you can really um, relate to. Uh, defiant, uh, rebel, rebellious. Uh, that's the way that the disease feels um, in your children. Um, you know, it... it it is resistant to treatment or cure. That's that's the definition of what we're going to address here today. But you know, this definition of what we're trying to achieve is that after recovery, um, refractory to reinfection or or relapse, and that's what we're really trying to achieve to to deal with the disease in a way that it will not come back ever. And that is a big 
um, part of what we're trying to um, do in our laboratory and many others. Um, precision medicine is an off-used term. I think you probably all know what it means, and it really is, to me, it's an individualization of therapy. And I'm going to come back to this point uh, very, very often. I think that many parents you know, get used to the protocolization of, of cancer therapy. It's that hor horrible time of diagnosis. You're sat down and you're given this whole cookbook of what's going to happen. Um, and for many children, they follow that cookbook and, and their disease goes into remission and stays in remission. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of children where that doesn't happen. And, and part of, dealing with refractory disease is, is moving from that protocolized nature of um, what we're doing to uh, individualizing um, um, the approach to curing neuroblastoma. It's really important to recognize, and I'm very proud of this fact, that, that precision medicine is not new um, in, for children with neuroblastoma. Uh, you're all aware, and, and Dr. Berlanga will get into this, I'm sure, uh, anti-GD2 therapy, you probably all know it firsthand. And, um, but, you know, this was a precision medicine that was discovered uh, or a precision approach that was discovered in the early 80s, and it took a long time to get this FDA and EMA approved, but it is a very precise therapy. It has off-tumor um, on-target effects that you all know very well, and so it being it's an important precise therapy, but I think we can do better. And MIBG that uh, Dr. Mathay is gonna talk about is another precision therapy. It's, it's designing a, a chemical that looks like um, a very natural chemical, norepinephrine, our fight and flight response. This is in our body. This is a, a neuroblastomas because they are, are come from those tissues. Um, they have receptors on their surface for this norepinephrine. And MIBG is a sneaky way to pretend like it's norepinephrine and, and to get it into cells. And so these precise therapies have been around for a long, long time. But there are many things that lead to the failure of those two therapies, as well as many other therapies. And I think that, um, the, the, you know, I'm going to show some science slides to try to make uh, a couple of points that many of you may be very well aware of. Um, the Every time we peel back the layers of the onion of neuroblastoma in the laboratory, I'm continuously surprised by how complex it is. And what's shown here in this, with these bars and these colors are a bunch of patients who were treated on our Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Precision Medicine trial. And in this trial, we're doing deep genetic sequencing of the tumors at various different points. And Listed down here are all the different genes that, that we have found mutated. So genes which make the proteins, genes are the building blocks. It's what cancer is, a disease of genes. And these are all the different mutations. Some patients have a lot of mutations. Some patients have fewer mutations, but they're all different. That's, that's the important point of this slide. And then, you know, for each individual patient who may have had seven tumor biopsies across the time, and I'll emphasize this on the next slide, these may change pretty dramatically over time. Um, and then this is just a sophisticated way to look at tumor chunks and to stain them with um, uh, dyes that reveal how um, there are different molecular features. And you can see that in a tumor chunk or different tumor chunks from the same patient, there's widely varying um, amounts of um, uh, genetic heterogeneity even though under the microscope, the tumor looks fairly homogeneous, it is really very, very complex. So this is a huge problem that we need to deal with uh, for your children. And then I mentioned this on the other, this is one child who was enrolled on our precision medicine trial. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, there's a biopsy up front, the tumor gets sequenced or analyzed, and you, you have a result. And in this patient, there was no mutation in this gene ALK. Um, uh, which is one that we think we can target. But you can see over the course of her several year um, battle with this disease, um, uh, she had things change depending upon where the tumor was in the body. And this is a very, very important point that I would love for you to go away with is that, that there 
a lot of physicians read, you know, a single biopsy. This is what the fact of the matter is for my child. And it's not that simple at all. And so um, one has to keep this in mind when um, trying to um, decide upon uh, therapies at the point in time where you are compared to the point uh, points in time that the child has been um, prior. Um, one of the most important things um, is um, to overcome refractory disease is to identify it early. Um, we think, and again, this is a resource issue that um, every neuroblastoma patient should have their tumor sequenced, the, you know, genetically analyzed at the time of diagnosis. Um, we are working on assays that are much cheaper and can be rolled out um, across the globe. Um, even at the time of diagnosis, um, while we're get, well, we are getting to the point where genetic sequencing at the time of diagnosis can change therapy. So I don't have it listed on the slide, but um, if there is a mutation in the ALK gene, um, there will be clinical trials where an inhibitor of that gene will be int introduced right in the beginning. And then there are other alterations that portend the fact that they, there might be significant resistance to chemotherapy. So children who have a mutation in this gene called ATRX, many of them have, um, are the type of patients with a more slow-growing, indolent type of tumor that doesn't respond to chemotherapy. Um, but many of those patients are very sensitive um, to immunotherapy. So these are the sort of patients that uh, we often change therapy um, early. And then McCann amplification, you've all heard about. The paradox is that many of those uh, patients whose tumor harbor that genetic alteration have a very good response to chemo, but then there's a subset where the tumor just grows through it. And so this sort of information really helps me as we're sort of rolling out the standard of care um, to figure out what to do for our patients. Um, I don't know if it's been talked about yet today or how many are familiar with so-called liquid biopsies or circulating tumor DNA. Um, this to me is, you know, in, in a few years will be um, standard way to um, uh, monitor patients with neuroblastoma. It is at our institution already, um, and the community is working very, very hard. So this is the ability to um, uh, detect um, uh, genetic changes in the tumor, in, in the bloodstream that, that are derived from the tumor, um, and um, monitor these over the time, over time. And I think I have a slide to show that. And then, you know, it's an old school test, but the urine VMA HVA is, is just another way to, to very easily determine whether or not your child's responding. And it's, it's surprising to me that many um, clinicians don't use it anymore. It's a, compared to everything else I've talked about, it's, you know, it's nickels. And, um, um, you know, if, if these numbers don't come down, there's a big problem. So um, monitoring and reacting to improvements or lack of improvements is very important. So this is, um, um, so the, the second very important thing in overcoming refractory disease is when you identify that a child has refractory disease, you wanna gain additional information. So this is, I'm not gonna get into the details of this, but this is the sort of information we get from liquid biopsies. So there's all these different mutations that were detected in this child's blood at diagnosis. And you can see that things didn't change. So we were very worried about this child until they got to immunotherapy and everything went away. So this is a patient who was primary refractory, but things were improving. So we didn't pull the plug on the standard of care. And this child remains in a remission. Um, the other thing that I think is really um, important is that the interventional radiologists in the childhood cancer field have gotten really good at sticking tiny needles into uh, areas where there's disease and getting tissue that can be sequenced and used to um, um, help guide therapy. So, so we at my institution have a fairly aggressive approach at using both liquid biopsies and tumor biopsies to get information to help us guide 
the, chair, the care of children with relapse disease or refractory disease. And then this is my final slide. Um, the, the approach, uh, once you're face, you, you've diagnosed refractory disease, um, you're on this road, um, it really is an individualization. Um, I said it in the beginning, um, based upon what your physicians can learn about um, your child, um, it may be that a clinical trial might make perfect sense because uh, you have abnormality X, Y, or Z, and that the trial is, is designed for, for abnormality X, Y, or Z. So I would really press to understand, you know, just because a child is eligible for a clinical trial doesn't mean it makes sense for that child at that time. And it may make perfect sense for another child with neuroblastoma. Um, I think that we're all getting increasingly good at using off-label therapies. Meet that what, what that means is that um, a drug was developed for an adult cancer, got FDA or EMA approved. Um, it has a mechanism of action or it works in a way that makes sense for the um, mutations or the changes in, in, in your child's tumor. And we can take those drugs and use them effectively. And I think that one has to be very proactive um, um, in, in monitoring if, you're, if you um, target a specific abnormality cancer is sinister and it can mutate and change and, and one has to mo monitor even when things are going good you don't put your head in the sand and you continue to react and circulating tumor dna or liquid biopsies are a good very good way to detect a relapse before it um, causes uh, symptoms and then i use this analogy all the time with my patients i i think that you know uh, we don't have a cure for aids yet but we most patients who have hiv um, can live a very, very long time and hope for that and, and hopefully be ready when that cure is there. And that's the approach that we take in our clinic. Um, uh, it, it's just obvious you cannot cure relapse or refractory disease unless you get a child into remission. So that's obviously the goal that we all have. And while there is no standard therapy for relapse, there is no foolproof plan you know, we are at a point, we are at a very exciting point where we are achieving remissions in children where I didn't think we could achieve a remission in the past, and we're controlling disease and having prolonged remissions in more and more children. And, and very importantly, by having an individualized approach to this, um, we're doing it in a way that we, we can maintain an enhanced quality of life. You know, we're not just hitting them again and again with, with very intensive chemotherapy. Um, and so this is the promise for the future. And I think you have an example of 16 folks here, and there's a lot more around the world who are working feverishly to find a cure and um, a little self-promotion here. But we just had a paper yesterday or two days ago published in Nature that you can look up that is a, a, a new approach to uh, immunotherapy that we think is going to be um, really important. and. Um, we have a clinical trial of that plan in about a year. Um, so there's a lot happening. Um, so um, uh, I, I do have hope for the future. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and see if I can figure out how to pass the baton back. Terrific. John, thank you so much for a, a very insightful and hopeful talk and, and for all that you and the team in Philadelphia do for kids. It's really remarkable. Um, let's move on now to our next speaker, who is Dr. Pablo Berlanga. Um, he is a pediatric oncology consultant at the Gustave Ruzzi Cancer Institute in France. And Dr. Berlanga, if I butchered the pronunciation there, you'll correct me. Um, uh, Dr. Berlanga is going to speak with us about relapse strategies. Uh, including a snapshot of current clinical trials. And we greatly appreciate him being with us um, on what is now a late Friday evening for him. So uh, Dr. Berlanga, the floor is yours. Dr. Belanger, so, sorry to interrupt you, but you're on mute. So if you could just unmute yourself, it'd be great. Thanks. Okay. 
So is it now okay? It's good now. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So I just was saying, so thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation of this symposium. And I will present uh, bring the next 15 minutes some uh, of the relapse strategies in uh, the SIOP and point of view, the European uh, group. So uh, what I will focus is in the rapid strategy of Sajopen and mainly in the case of relapse of progression of high risk and neuroblastoma patients, which are the uh, main focus of this, of this talk. So as uh, John said before, so there are several options at the time of uh, relapse or progression of disease. Uh, we always try to do our best and improve what we do. So sometimes, so for many years, there has been several chemotherapy-based options as first line for these uh, patients. And uh, in Europe, as you all probably know, so we have uh, developed a couple of trials to try to understand which is the best option for these patients. So in the case in Europe, in the case of first relapse or progression of the high risk, a patient with high risk neuroblastoma, we recommend chemotherapy-based uh, treatment. And as uh, John said, the molecular profiling, biopsy, new biopsy, if feasible, that will be very important as we will see afterwards. So these two trials are currently closed. The BICON trial, some of the results have been shared in the last uh, two years in ASCO presentation and also in this meeting by Lucas Moreno. And it was a randomized trial to compare several schedules of chemotherapy, adding on top or not bevabizumab. Some of these results are, as I said, uh, already shared. Some others are still waiting, like the topotica and randomization. And uh, as uh, John also said, uh, no, it's not just about chemotherapy, it's not just about adding anti-angiogenic uh, treatment like babisumab, but also about the potential role of immunotherapy combined with chemotherapy, chemoimmunotherapy, in the time of relapse. So this has been addressed by the European group. It's a trial that closed several months ago and that we hope to have uh, the results in the next uh, weeks. In that trial, there was a randomization between conventional chemotherapy, temozolamide uh, topotican, and temozolamide topotican antinituximab beta, the anti-GD2 uh, antibody that is used in, in Europe. Another approach, uh, led by the German group, that is now part of uh, Sajepen, is uh, combining or uh, chemotherapy with uh, target therapies, rap rapamycin and, uh, um, and the satinib, that it's also closed and that the results will be available in the near weeks. So with these results that we hope to have in the next months, we will be able to define which is the best option for patients uh, at the first relapse based on these uh, trials. But also the second part is what do we do in the case that treatment uh, achieves what we want, that is response for stabilization of the disease. So in those patients that uh, they get better thanks to the treatment, there is so, several options. Sorry? Dr. Berlanga, so sorry for the introduction again, but we want folks to get the most out of your talk. And I don't think we can see your slides. So if there's a, huh? a way to, yeah, I don't think we can see your slides. So if you could put those up, okay. um, that would be good. I think you need to share them again. Okay. Can you see my slide now? There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, sorry, because without slides, I don't know if you could understand much of it, but what I wanted to say is that, uh, so in first relapse, we have the beacon and risk trials that will we have the results soon. And uh, we have several options. So then if the disease is controlled thanks to the treatment, there are several options, there are uh, several approaches in Europe, sometimes some uh, countries prefer to continue with the same treatment that has achieved a response in that patient. That is, for example, the case in France, in Spain. In some of the cases, there are other uh, treatments like to try to consolidate, to try to do as in first line treatment, to do high dose chemotherapy uh, or to try to do aplo uh, stem cell uh, transplantation and also to combine with uh, anti gd 2 afterwards. So this is one, uh, this is a several approaches in Europe that uh, probably will be uh, tested in a trial in the near future. And it's Angelica Eger from uh, Germany that is leading this proposal. But what we know is that even if we try to do our best in many patients after the first treatment, patients will continue prolapse progressing. So at that time we have several trials 
and uh, we, these uh, trials need to be based on the, or if possible, they will be based on the information of the biopsy that was done at the time of first relapse, if it could be done. So this is what John said before, it's very important to try to do, if feasible, a new biopsy at the time of relapse, the tumor evolves with trying, get persistent to the treatment, even if it was done at the very beginning, it's important to redo it again, because that can help in the case of a subsequent relapse afterwards. As John said, so there are several uh, molecular profiling programs in the US, in, uh, in Europe. There are several types of techniques from panel sequencing, more broad, whole exome, whole genome. But all of them try to try to identify the genes that uh, we could uh, target to try to improve the uh, response and the treatment for, for these patients. So here I will just give a brief update of the MAPIAX program, which is the molecular profiling program in France, not just in France, but also in some other European uh, countries, that uh, is closed for one year, that uh, was led by France, but also participated Italy, Ireland, and Spain. And it was not just for neuroblastoma, it was for all patients that had a relapsed progression. And uh, the idea of this uh, trial was a prospective trial. So the patient they proposed uh, the trial or the, was proposed to the family. A new biopsy was uh, proposed to the family. And if they accepted, patients could be included. And the objective was to see how many patients could, at the end of the day, really benefit from this approach. So here, this trial opened from February 2016 to July 2020, almost 800 patients. And as you can see, so the study intervention was performed mostly at the time of first lab operation, which is the current recommendations. And if we look to the neuroblastoma patients, just some very few information is that we had uh, 104 patients out of the 800 that had a neuroblastoma in this cohort of patients, some more interventions than patients because a second intervention could be done in case the first one was not uh, good enough or the results were not uh, feasible. And uh, what it's important to say is that even in the good centers or trying to do our best, in 30% of the cases, the tumor samples were not of good enough, uh, uh, there were not enough uh, tumor cells of good quality to be able to perform the studies that we wanted to do. And in those that we have a sequencing uh, that was successful, around 75% we had uh, defined at least one potential uh, abnormality in the tumor that could lead to a target therapy for the patient. Here you have the alterations that you can find. Some of them are known from the beginning of the APCs, like MIC-11, alterations as John said before, but also cell cycle, rust pathway alterations and limited uh, mutational rate. This is just to show you that all these alterations that I've said that we found in this molecular profiling for these patients with neuroblastoma can in most of them be treated in clinical trials with target therapies. And I just marked before ARC because ARC is so far the only one that uh, really has shown response and clear benefit in the case of a, a relapse in the relapse setting. All the others are alterations that we need to explore and the best way to explore that is in clinical trials and thanks to these results we hope that we can continue improving things that we are doing currently. As you see in the previous slide uh, I speak of the SMART you can see the number the name SMART in some of the uh, trials so SMART is a also French uh, European a, a trial that was led by, by France as Birgit Georgia, the DPI. And uh, in this uh, basket trial was uh, done at the same time of the MAPIA, the molecular profiling, to try to improve the access of target therapies in the case of relapse for these patients, knowing that uh, the clinical trials that we had at that time were very few. And in order to try to improve the possibility to give target therapies within a clinical trial for these patients. Here, I have just uh, put all the, the, the arms and the combinations that were able, that were in that trial. This trial, one of the beauty is that uh, it's a live trial in which new arms can be open and arms that have not shown enough uh, response uh, can be closed. And this is why you see that since uh, 2016, uh, new arms have been added to the trial and more uh, arms will be added in the next future. And this is just to say you that in that uh, trial from uh, so in the last five years, 180 patients have been included. But if we look, taking into account the huge need that we have for patients with neuroblastoma, it's a bit short to say that only 15 patients of this 
180 had an erulastoma. So it means that we need to do better. We need to better maybe uh, develop uh, specific arms that are more focused for neuroblastoma, or if we think that one of these uh, treatments are of benefit for neuroblastoma, try to include the patients in these trials because they could uh, they could benefit. So this is was leaded by France, but it's currently open in UK, in Netherlands, in Italy, and in Spain. And just a bit to finalize, so this is the strategy that I was sharing before. So first lab, beacon risk, we hope to have results very soon. If the disease responds, then we may think of a potential consolidation, like in first line, or maybe continue with the same treatment. And the biopsy molecular profile and death relapse is very important. But it's also a, rea a reality, what John said before, is that many patients receive new treatments, innovative treatments, outside clinical trials, sometimes based on the molecular profiling that we think that that can benefit, a target therapy can benefit, and there is no option to do that in a clinical trial. So something that is very widely discussed right now is how to collect those data, because those data are important to know what we should do or what we should, uh, we should stop doing. So this is a, um, a proposal or approach that we try to address in, uh, in France with a study that is called Secure Access to Innovative Medicines for Children with Cancer, and that is developed by the New Drug Development Committee of the French uh, Society. And this is an observational study in which we try to collect prospective uh, data of toxicity and efficacy of innovative therapies that are given off-label or as an compassionate use program. So in France, it's uh, quite organized within interregional discussions in the way that uh, we try to discuss with other colleagues which are the options that we can offer to other patients. And we uh, said that, for example, it was mandatory before inclusion in this observational study that the case of a patient was discussed with other colleagues to ensure that there were not other better options than the off-label use that we wanted to do. So this is a trial that is up and running that started in March 2020 that is open in all the different uh, centers that uh, treat patients with uh, so children and adolescents with cancer. And one of the important things of this uh, project is that so far, more than 90% of the centers have at least registered one patient in this, in this database. This was presented in the Accelerate uh, discussion several months ago, and currently ITCC is working in trying to enlarge this uh, proposal, this such a French experience, to the international level, to the ITCC uh, countries, and it's something that will be presented in a couple of weeks in the next ITCC annual meeting. So just to finalize, as John said, try to do a new biopsy for molecular profiling. It's strongly recommended at the time of relapse or progression of the disease. In some cases, even if done in good centers and by good people, there is not enough uh, tumor cells to be able to do uh, the successful sequencing. CTDNA is what it's called liquid biopsy, that was also said by John, but I have not addressed it in my talk. Patients that have ALK alteration should have the possibility to receive ALK inhibitors at the time of relapse or progression, but that will also be, uh, thankfully, uh, available at the time of first relapse, uh, not just in the US, but also in uh, Europe in the uh, three, six months from now on. Apart from ALK inhibitors for the other alterations that we can find in the tumors, to my knowledge, there is uh, no or limited efficacy. So we have to try to test these drugs in clinical trials because it's the only way to really know at the end of the day what we are doing and to try to continue improving. But also we need to face the truth that sometimes it can be done outside clinical trials, trying to do our best, but we need to try to collect this data to know what we are doing. If we see responses, try to really develop a clinical trial in which patients can benefit and to continue improving and continue learning all together. So this is just to thank the people from MAPIAC, Smart, Sasha, and thank you very much, and do not hesitate to ask any question. Thank you very much, Dr. Berlanga. What a great talk, and I know that it spurred a lot of interest based on the questions that are coming in. So we look forward to addressing those um, later in the session. Let's uh, turn now to our next speaker, who is Dr. Kate Mathay. Um, Kate is also someone who doesn't really need much of an introduction here, but I'm going to give her a quick one. She is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, and she has really dedicated her career to improving outcomes uh, for neuroblastoma patients. And this includes um, being a founding co-leader 
of the New Approaches to Neuroblastoma Therapy uh, Consortium, the NANT group. Um, and she's also been a leader in the development of MIBG therapy, and that is what she is here to speak with us about today. So, Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gavin. So nice to see you. And it's such a pleasure to be here to talk to all you parents around the world. Uh, are my slides showing? Ah. Um, I, I do have a disclosure very similar to that of John Maris, which is that um, I can't get to slideshow. Let's see. Um, sorry. Which is that MIBG, while it is readily available in, in high income countries, um, for both visualization of neuroblastoma and therapy is not available even for scans. And at least half of the countries I talk with uh, in our low and middle income tumor board weekly for neuroblastoma. So uh, it, it is an important element of therapy like GD2. It was first developed for therapy in the early 1980s. Um, and it is almost universally expressed the, the gene that uh, takes up MIBG, the human norepinephrine transporter is present in 90% of tumors. So it's a fairly universal target. Uh, it is very similar in structure as you see here to norepinephrine, which is a normal product of the adrenal gland. And since neuroblastoma is derived from sympathetic neural crest cells, often in the adrenal, it takes up the MIBG, which is so similar to norepinephrine. And it's very specific for imaging, as you can see in this MIBG scan of a child with metastatic neuroblastoma to multiple bones, as well as a primary in the left side of the abdomen. So the rationale for using high dose iodine 131 MIBG is that it can target not just the primary tumor, which we normally radiate with external beam radiation, but it can target all the bone metastases or other soft tissue metastases. And uh, <clears throat> the response rates at very early studies was quite variable, initially as low as 10%. But that was because the activity that you could infuse was limited by radiation safety considerations and also because some of the MIBG goes to the bone marrow and damages the blood forming cells. So we showed that by we could escalate the dose successfully by infusing back autologous stem cells. And this just shows a picture of a, a child in a lead-lined room with lead shields, which are necessary to protect the hospital personnel and family of the patients who will be quite radioactive, especially the first two or three days. We also protect their thyroid gland from the iodine, which can be taken up and cause low thyroid function later. And we protect the bladder by encouraging frequent urination or placing a Foley catheter. So because of all these considerations, initially MIBG therapy was limited to only four centers in the US and which now as we see its utility has it been expanded to over 20 centers. Um, and finally the FDA has actually approved one form of I-131 MIBG the, and uh, insurance generally will cover the cost. So we did a very large phase two study in conjunction with Michigan and CHOP. And we showed uh, that in 164 patients, 36% of them had a significant response to the treatment. Um, and another third of the patients had stable disease for several months. And that again, we were able to stop the hematologic toxicity by infusing stem cells. And, you just see here, of course, one of our best responses where a child with MIBG uptake and every bone in the skeleton was treated and uh, went into a complete remission with no MIBG uptake three months later. Um, we then decided, well, how can we improve uh, MIBG further, just like chemotherapy where we give combination therapy. 
So uh, one of our trials, we used irinotecan, which is a chemotherapy drug that was found in other types of solid tumors to improve the response to radiation. So we combined vincristin and irinotecan with MIBG, and we showed that this combination was tolerable, and we still had a good response rate. Um, we then thought, well, another way is can we improve the uptake of MIBG uh, by using a drug that changes uh, expression of the human norepinephrine transporter, which takes up MIBG. And varinostat is such a drug that has an epigenetic mechanism. And you can see in this plot that the expression of the norepinephrine transporter in the upper panel increases with increasing concentrations of varinostat. The middle panel shows uh, that MIBG uptake is improved in two different neuroblastoma cell lines as you increase concentrations of varinostat. And the third panel shows an experiment we did in mice with neuroblastoma tumors uh, where they got three doses of radiation and in the upper curves, they got either radiation alone or varinostat alone or just nothing. And the bottom curve where the tumors barely grew is the combination of varinostat with radiation. So based on these preclinical results at UC, we went and did in the NANT consortium a clinical trial where we gave varinostat for 14 days and gave an MIBG beginning on the third day and gave stem cell infusion. And again, we showed a nice response rate and we showed that this was tolerable at the highest dose of MIBG. And then we said, well, which is better? So uh, Steve Du Bois in the NANT consortium led a, a trial that was randomized where patients got either MIBG only, MIBG with vincristin and irinotecan, or MIBG with varinostat. And we looked at the response rate and toxicity. And you can see here uh, arm A, which was MIBG alone, that B was with the irinotecan, and C was with varinostat. And they all had approximately 35 patients. And when you look, if you move over to the column of response, the complete and partial response rate in both the MIBG alone and the MIBG with the Renotecan were quite low. And it was almost double in the MIBG with Varinostat arm. If we included patients who responded in one modality and had what we call a minor response along with complete and partial response, you can, but did not progress in, in either their soft tissue or their bone marrow. You can see again that it was nearly double the effectiveness with the MIBG and varinostat, whereas the chemotherapy did not appear to add anything to the MIBG other than some toxicity. So in a new trial, uh, again, we're trying to take all the benefits we've seen with immunotherapy and combine them with the MIBG. And this is because both MIBG and dinatuximab, the anti-GD2 antibody, have shown good activity in neuroblastoma, both in the relapse and refractory setting. Uh, we know that radiation changes the local tumor immunophenotype, the cells that protect the tumor, for example, from the immune system, and changes the inflammatory response. So we hope that by combining these two, we will enhance the immune recognition of the tumor and infiltration of immune cells to deliver uh, the immunotherapy. So this is an ongoing trial. I cannot give you any results yet, except to say it has been uh, well tolerated at the highest dose. The patients get the donatuximab, in the usual dosage, and then they get um, uh, after the a week after the MIBG therapy. And then because MIBG can hang out in the tumor cells for quite a while, for several weeks, we give a second dose of dinatuximab to interact with any remaining radiation emissions in the tumor at one month. 
So we hope to have results of this trial uh, within the next few months. We also, um, I think uh, you're all aware that MIBG is used as a measure of response just prior to transplant using a semi-quantitative score we call the Curie scoring system in Europe. They use a, a modified, more detailed version of this. And it has been shown um, by studying large numbers of patients, both in Europe, European SIAPIN trials and in North America, that the Curie score at the end of induction before transplant definitely is a pr important prognostic factor. Uh, and if you have a Curie score of less than or equal to two, your outcome would look uh, in prior transplant studies like the upper curve with 40 to 50% event-free survival compared to a very low event-free survival with a higher Curie score. And of course, if your Curie score is zero with no evident disease, your outcome is even better. So we're looking uh, for more precise ways to image with uh, MIBG. And we did a study at UC using a different isotope called iodine-124 that allows you to image with PET technology shown here, which is much more accurate for localizing disease and showing up very small areas in the skeleton. Uh, another approach, uh, which was pioneered at Sloan Kettering, is to use fluorine 18 and use it in MFBG. So it's essentially the same compound, but with fluorine substituted for iodine. And again, you can do this with uh, PET imaging. And early trials showed that this um, gave quite good results um, comparable to MIBG. So these are two newer uh, ways that may be used. We then wanted to say, well, how can how can MIBG therapy, you know, it's great to treat relapse, but we know that even with responses, patients rarely have long-term survival. So uh, we said, let's try to do this earlier. And we first did a, a trial in refractory patients in the NANT, giving MIBG right before the high-dose chemotherapy and transplant. So MIBG with carboplatin, etoposide, and melphalan. And we had some encouraging results with uh, responses in refractory patients and some survivors. Um, we then did a uh, study to show feasibility in a larger group of institutions uh, in the children's oncology group and many more institutions geared up to use I-131 MIBG. And here we gave our standard induction and then treated with MIBG, but then waited a couple of months to give busulfan melphalan consolidation based on some SIOPIN results showing that this might be better than the our CEM carboetoposide melphalan. And we showed again that using this approach, it was feasible. 96% of the patients who entered got their MIBG and 81% uh, were able to get MIBG with Bumel. We did find that the incidence of veno-occlusive disease, or SOS, which is a liver problem that occurs post-transplant, was somewhat higher using the MIBG pre-transplant than with the chemotherapy alone. So it was 31%, whereas in <coughs> other studies of Bumel, the incidence was 20%. So we now have an ongoing study of MIBG upfront in the children's oncology group <clears throat> where patients are randomly assigned to get standard induction and then tandem transplant and immunotherapy or to get <clears throat> standard induction but with a course of MIBG therapy now early in induction after the third cycle. And, uh, and get tandem transplant. And in the third group, we were giving Bumel instead of tandem transplant. So the other two arms were non-randomized based on patients who had an ALK aberration who got crisotinib or the 10% who were MIBG non-AVID who just got standard treatment. 
We recently discovered that for reasons we do not know, but the arm with the MIBG and Bumel had a poorer uh, uh, outcome on our initial monitoring. So that arm has been dropped and we are just randomizing between standard induction and induction with MIBG, all getting tandem transplant. And we're about halfway through this protocol. We hope that it will give us an answer uh, finally about this therapy, whether it improves surgical resection, improves re survival. So I'll close by just naming a few future directions. Um, there are some groups who want to target a different receptor on neuroblastoma called the SSRT receptor, which is also found in pheochromocytoma, another rare tumor. And they have been targeting this with uh, dotatate, um, which is taken up by this receptor attached to lutetium or gallium. And you, you can see here a picture of a scan with gallium dotatate. And, Again, it can be give PET imaging with very nice definition. Uh, and there are some comparisons with MIBG which show it is at least comparable. However, the initial um, targeted therapy, there have been two trials with this, neither of which saw any responses in refractory or relapsed patients. So I'm not sure this is a good approach. Uh, we're looking uh, at now combining the anti-GD2 antibody with varinostat in a new NANT trial that is under development and combining MIBG with other radio sensitizers. Uh, you can see in the lower panel an Aurora kinase inhibitor in a mouse experiment where we combined it with MIBG and showed uh, at uh, least additive uh, effect with the blue line being the combination on the bottom with the least no tumor growth in that group. Um, and we're also uh, interesting work done at Dr. Maris's group uh, of astatine MIBG, a different isotope again with a emission length, uh, a possibly combining that with I-131 so that you have isotopes that of different lengths that reach different parts of the tumor, some in single cells and some in larger tumors. And uh, finally, some groups are looking at using the norepinephrine transporter um, receptor with nanoparticles for targeted drug delivery. So there are several new approaches and we will have to see how to best combine these things and, and with, especially in the refractory patients uh, that Dr. Berlanga and Dr. Maris discussed. So again, I need to acknowledge it always takes a village. Many, many uh, of my colleagues listed here and many more who have entered patients on these trials, uh, as well as sponsors and the NIH and pharma. So thank you to all of you for listening and I'll be happy to take questions with everybody else. Kate, wow, thanks for a terrific talk and, and for all you do. And yes, there are a lot of great questions about MIBG that we'll get to here in just a second. But let's uh, turn now to our final speaker, um, who is my friend, Laura Weberling. Um, Laura and I have served together on the NANT Parent Advisory Council for a number of years now. And uh, like Dr. Mathay, she is there in the great state of California. And she is going to talk with us about perhaps the most important topic for parents, and that is hope. So Laura, let me turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us. Okay, thanks so much, Gavin. Let me let me share my screen here. Uh, window. Share. Okay, I just want to. Uh, say yeah thank you so much for having me Laura Weberl and Gavin we actually moved to Oregon so <laughs> we were in California not that long ago but now I'm in Portland um, so pleased to be part of this relapse panel I'm uh, so grateful to the parents and advocates who've made this conference happen their efforts are truly life and game changing for us as families Donna, thank you for inviting me to join you and, and for um, both carte blanche and poetic license on this topic. I really kind of think of myself more as just the parent cheerleader here 
Um, and you know what? I've thought a lot about hope these past several weeks and the role it plays in fighting neuroblastoma. And I think it's important for uh, just for a moment to acknowledge that this is, of course, an emotionally rigorous and heartbreaking undertaking that we're all on. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of science and numbers and these doctors who are so kind, they recognize that there's a lot of heart and emotion behind this, too. So first, I'd like to share our story, uh, at least the high points. And then I'd like to um, share what I think hope is and how it helps us get through treatment. Then I'll close with a poem. And I hope each of us can recall and recognize the impact of hope on our own journeys. Uh, our son, Hans, fought his neuroblastoma for six years from the time he was three in the fall of 06 until he ultimately succumbed to his disease at the age of nine in 2012. And he went through standard treatment protocol at the time in 06 and 07, which of course predated immunotherapy and the frontline treatment here. And it included only one transplant. But other than that was similar, I think, to the current frontline therapy in the US. We got through treatment and had achieved the status of no evidence of disease. Oh, whoops, I skipped the slide. Um, and in the spring of 08, we were just beginning to try out the idea of easing into a more normal lifestyle and what that could possibly look like for us. We were thinking about getting a kayak when we noticed that Hans wasn't quite using his right arm right. I noticed that he would use both hands to take a sip of his drink. I noticed he would sort of pull at the cuff of his right sleeve to move his arm around. And an x-ray in a desperate ER visit confirmed probable recurrence of his stage four amplified neuroblastoma. That uh, ER visit happened on a weekend, so we went home to schedule a follow-up visit with our oncologist. And as I waited for our car in the valet line outside of Texas Children's Hospital, I looked at my little four-year-old sitting in his umbrella stroller and tried to explain to him that his boo-boo, as we referred to his tumor at the time, was trying to come back. And he looked up at me with his big sea green eyes and with pure faith and complete confidence, Hans said, well, my doctors will just have to get it out of there. And from that moment on, Hans's spirit led our fight for, against relapse. Our doctors will just have to get it out of there. And with hope and faith and science and these amazingly smart researchers that network across the globe, we proceeded. Upon that consultation after that first ER visit, our doctor confirmed the relapse and suggested we should, quote, take lots of pictures and go to Disneyland. So, of course, we got the vibe from our, that our frontline doctor didn't have the same vision for this relapse fight that we did. We did our homework, made some calls, sent some emails in search of a different, more hopeful approach. And having attended Pat Tollingen's CNCF conference the previous summer, we were certainly well poised to do so. We ultimately got on a plane to Philadelphia and somehow we wound up in the office of Dr. John Maris and so began a new treatment pathway. Uh, big picture, this slide actually shows Hans, Hans's treatment pathway from 2006 through 2012. And I certainly don't mean for you to read each line. I just put it all on one slide to share the impact. It was a lot. He went through a lot. Each new treatment was preceded by a failure of the previous attempt and a new progression. Each time our Hans got back in the ring like a tiny gladiator. And you know, when you first relapse, you don't know what your treatment is going to look like. They're developing strategies now, of course, but no one would ever sit down and write this plan up. It's reactive, it's intuitive, it's responsive to two moving targets, the ever-changing tumor, and thankfully, the ever-advancing research. It's really hard and so scary. There's no roadmap, 
no finish line. There's just hope, a good team, and your little child. And I want to tell you that it takes every single resource that you've got. You just have to put it all out there. Your brains, your guts, your brawn, your passion, your faith, your charm, your ability to network and learn, all of it. You bring every gift and resource that you have to this fight. And of course, it takes hope. Uh, this next slide actually shows with the sons how many different hospitals our Hans was treated at. And he was treated at clinical trials on three of those. At one point in our treatment journey, um, we made a much anticipated and long awaited family move to California. And we transferred care into the welcoming arms of Dr. Araz Marcellian at CHLA. Um, we did do some MIBG trials at UCSF with Dr. Du Bois. And of course, Dr. Matei was overseeing at that time. So Hans somehow wound up with this incredible dream team fighting for him. I just threw on here that the Blue Stars are facilities where we had at some point in treatment received consultation. And the Red Stars are where we were able to visit the children's hospitals um, and get labs while we were living our lives and visiting family when Hans was doing well. Of course, at the time, we always knew that odds weren't good for relapse. But we also knew that they were doing research every day, all over the country, around the globe. So we focused on those facts that those numbers were changing. There's this huge element in myster of mystery when you're fighting neuroblastoma. And you have to embrace that mystery and you have to proceed with hope. Um, I like Webster's dictionary definition of hope here, uh, to cherish a desire with anticipation. But there are some words that are truly best pondered, discussed, even whispered about over co coffee or cocktails by the fire or under the stars, and hope is one of those. We all share the hope that our children will make it through, that our families will remain whole, but what hope looks like and feels like to each of us is different. It will look individual for each of us, but I think once we really examine it and reflect back, uh, we'll find this ever-present thread. Hope is a constant companion in all human trials. And as far as being human goes, stage four, high risk, multi-relapse neuroblastoma is certainly a formidable trial. Yet hope is ever present. It's always there. Sometimes we tap into it more than others. Sometimes we allow it to flood in. When we give it the fuel of stillness and silence, it flourishes. When we can slow down, be still, focus and pay attention, it's right there. It's right there all along as we face the most difficult things. It's like a warm glow that leaps into the heart. It floods the system. It's there like a reliable spring, like Old Faithful. It's there riding shotgun with us in all its unabashed glory. It's a bright light that illuminates from the inside, a warm feeling that all will be well, an inner glow. It lifts us up and propels us forward. It can come to us from within as a feeling or an image. I had an image of Hans just simply jumping up to catch a football at the park with his friends. That image as a grown young man, you know, that image would occur to me over and over. The simple image of Hans having a life on the other side of treatment. And I found it was mutually exclusive to my terrors and fears. And I, I always say that hope is a, our, our treatment. I'm sorry. I always say our treatment is our life raft, our treatment plan. We cling to it. And hope keeps it afloat. In another image I'd have, Hans and I were hanging on to that life raft. And it was really more like a flimsy little kickboard. And we were on this fast 
moving, challenging river with rapids, and it was exhausting. But just ahead, off to the shore, was a lagoon, a still blue pool, and we just had to make it over there. So I think we all have these images or visual mantras that come to us and bring us peace and calm in our storm and remind us of what is possible, of what we're fighting for. Hope is unique. It's personal and private. You don't have to share it with anyone. It can be yours alone. It can be a secret. You can keep it in your back pocket. Hope is your chariot. It awaits. Hope can also be this, it can be this internal feeling or vision, but it can also be uh, brought to us and delivered to us through others. Sometimes it might come on a silver platter, like a free flight to Philly on a flight, private jet. Or other times it comes on a red plastic tray from Target, a bag of popcorn or an ice cream cone for your little baldy. Sometimes it gets dropped off on the front porch. Teddy bears, coloring books, Legos and Transformers, dinner kits all lovingly packaged up for your family of four. It's perfect flaky dinner rolls and so many beautiful lasagnas. And once it arrived as a gorgeous layered green salad with bright orange ribbons of peeled carrots and red cherry tomatoes. We can all think about the ways our friends, family, healthcare providers, and even strangers have showed up about how their large and small gestures have brought us hope. You can't do this journey without it. You sort of have to do it with your head in the clouds. Of course, there are some things that hope is not. Hope can't be prescribed, sanctioned, re relegated, measured, discouraged, or even reasoned with. It's a basic element of being human, of what makes you uniquely you, and it's yours. Of course, hope doesn't promise you anything. It isn't a wishing well, or a magic eight ball, or a genie in a bottle, but it's yours. And a glowing internal comfort, constant companion. And it could never betray you. Like love, it is forever. So now for us, for our family, we aren't fighting anymore and things look different. Now we have the, many of the normal hopes of any family for joy and purpose and prosperity. Um, we also find hope through the activities that we do to honor Hans and all the kids fighting this disease and contribute to this community through our advocacy, our fundraising, our research panel reviews that we engage in. We hope for a world where every child thrives. And I know things are changing every day with the disease. And I just know one day they're going to figure it out. And I've always thought one day, I bet they're gonna win the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, for me now though, there's a feeling I can tap into. And it's a feeling in my body and my mind. And it brings me right back into that loving space with Hans. When I can get really quiet and still and often just before I fall asleep, I tap into that sense of love and peace and connection in my body and in my mind. And I feel the same sensation and emotion as when he was right there loving me. And I tap into that space and feel how we remain connected. We're just on a different plane. And I like to exist in that space for a little while every day. That's part of what my hope feels like now. And I thought I'd share that with you. Um, I invite you all to just sort of close your eyes and take a moment. Uh, and if you choose, I'd like you to think about what your hope looks like and feels like for you. As I close with a favorite poem by Ms. Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul 
and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could up bash a little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Thank you, everyone. I wish you all peace, strength, comfort, and hope as you endure and persevere on your journeys. And a huge thank you to uh, our organizers for creating this space for us. Well, Laura, wow, thank you so much um, for that incredible talk. It really, I'll just be honest, it hit home for me directly because when you talked about Hans, um, three years old in the fall of 2006 being diagnosed, that is exactly the situation that we had with Evan, as I think you know. And um, that map looked very familiar to me as well. And I know that your words meant a lot to a lot of people. So thank you for sharing them. Thank you, Gavin. And now let's um, let's turn to questions, if we could. Um, there are just a number of great questions here. The challenge is going to be to get to as many of them as we can. I think there are 26 at last count. We've got until a little bit after four o'clock to work our way through. And I'm just going to start at question number one and uh, work our way through as many as we can get to. So um, let's jump to it with um, the first question, which is, what are the worst genetic mutations for neuroblastoma? Um, there are so many, and are they all important? So I will throw that out to the panel. Uh, I'll be happy to start, and thank you for your question. Um, the first thing I would say is that, and this probably isn't relevant to anyone in the um, on the Zoom, is that if a child is thought to have not have high risk neuroblastoma and there's any one of these mutations, that child is at very high risk for relapse and progressing to high-risk neuroblastoma. Um, it's a difficult question because they all have um, different meanings. And so cancer is a disease of mutations and they, they're what make every one of your child's clinical courses slightly different because the different mutations mold um, um, the way the tumor behaves. And as I try to emphasize, there can often be, um, you know, we think of cancer as a tree. There's, there's an event at the very trunk of the tree that starts it, but then there are all these branches where things, there are different mutations that take it in different directions. And that's what makes it very complicated. So I'm probably not answering your question, um, but it is very important for your care provider to understand what mutations are there and what potential therapeutic options related to those mutations are available. Thanks, John. Anybody else before we move on? Okay, next question. Are liquid biopsies also useful for relapsed patients or only in case of refractory neuroblastoma? Pablo, you want to take that first? Yeah. So I think that liquid biopsy can be useful, as John presented before, in all the cases. So you can, it can be useful to follow the patient, how the patient is responding. If the patient relapses, if it's refractory, what we know is that sometimes if the disease is more or less controlled, sometimes the possibility to find something in the liquid biopsy is lower, or if it's a localized relapse, for example, than if it's a multimetastatic disease widely spread. But it's a very useful tool that we are knowing to use each time a bit more. And that it's a very useful in the case of uh, patients, for example, as there were some questions that uh, a new biopsy cannot be performed. Thank you very much. And let me just move to the next question. It's one I'm interested in as well. And uh, the question is, why do we only look at five years when kids can relapse after 10 years? Kate, do you want to start with that? You're on mute, Kate. Kate, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I think uh, we can even have relapses after 10 years, but as time goes on, relapse 
becomes less and less likely. The majority of relapses with neuroblastoma occur in the first uh, two years. And then each, uh, as time goes on, the uh, likelihood of relapse becomes less and less. We are only limited by the follow-up that we get. For example, in the COG, after 10 years, we do not usually follow patients because of the cost and they transition to other providers. So we're very interested and I'm fascinated, uh, not in a good way, I guess, but to find out what would make a child be in remission for eight years or 10 years and then relapse. And we are learning some about the molecular aberrations. For example, I've noticed that children who have an 11Q deletion tend to be often relapse later rather than earlier, and MICN amplification will often relapse very rapidly or cause a more rapid relapse. But we, we there are any relapse is important, but usually if it's a longer time from diagnosis to relapse, then you get the child back in remission. In my experience, that tends to give you a longer time even in second remission. That's great. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, just looking at the clock here, let's just keep moving on. And, and I'm not going to discriminate in the questions. We'll just take them as they come. I imagine this next one is going to include part of the answer will depend on the specifics of, of the patient case. But the question is, what is, your, what is your view on doing DFMO or the vaccine trial at Sloan Kettering? And I can start with that as, you know, um, as someone who looks very hard at the data, um, I'm, I'm, I do not refer my patients for DFMO because I have not seen anything that convinces me that, that it is a, um, an effective therapy at the doses used. Um, I, I am very interested in the fact, you know, people have been trying to vaccinate against cancer for, for 20, 30 years. And in fact, the other conference I'm in, there was a whole session on vaccine development. Um, you know, the paper that the Sloan Group published um, earlier this year is is very interesting. I mean, I think that the two things that are known for sure is that the vaccine's safe and they're getting antibodies, just like you know they get COVID antibodies. You're getting antibodies. Uh, whether that translates into protecting from relapse is we don't know yet. Um, but I think the science is is there for the vaccine. I think it's a very interesting, exciting um, uh, reagent. Thanks, John. Pablo or Kate? I, I echo what John said about the vaccine and, and the DFMO being fairly unproven. I think the the vaccine, just like the COVID vaccine, unfortunately, is not 100% protective. And I've had patients relapse after the vaccine, just like after other things. So we don't have the perfect treatment yet. I fully agree. So I think that also, as John said, so sometimes the publications or the papers have to be looked carefully because there is sometimes like a small bias in selection of the patients because we know that the farther the patient on treatment, the lower the possibility that the, the disease comes back. So the more the, at the end of the treatment, the possibility that the disease comes back is much lower than at the beginning. So this is a reality. So sometimes this is important to really understand what it's published in these papers, because if you just compare from the very beginning of the disease, it looks like amazing. But if you compare to the data that we have, for example, in Europe, that we don't have any access to the FOMO or to these vaccines and therapies for the moment, it doesn't look so different. So I think to something to further explore, something that we need to understand better, but still something that we cannot say that it's recommended. Very good. Thank you all for those helpful answers. Um, let's move on here to question five. <clears throat> Can molecular subtypes differ between tumor, tumor sites in the same patient? Absolutely. And, and that is, um, you know, as we're learning more from liquid biopsies and doing multiple uh, tumor biopsies, um, this is a very common thing where the disease is not uniform at different sites in the body. And, um, um, and so it, the answer is yes, and it's something that one has to be aware of. I agree. So this is what, what it's called, the temporal and special heterogeneity of the tumor. 
so that we know that the, the tumor evolves and it's not the same at the very beginning, one year afterwards, three years afterwards, or also at the same time. And that explains sometimes patients that may have some parts of the tumor that respond to metastasis, but some others that sometimes progress, probably because uh, the biology is completely different. Very good. All right. Uh, next question. What is your view of haplo? Can it work to get back into remission? I think that, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting other way to manipulate the immune system. And I know there are trials, uh, particularly in Germany, with haplo transplant, which has become more feasible as, as people have gotten better at preventing the complications such as graft-versus-host disease and other uh, defective immune function after transplant. So there are interesting studies. I think it's still quite preliminary as whether it will improve the outcome when coupled with infusions of natural killer cells or anti-GD2 antibody, but it, I consider it quite preliminary and experimental at this point. Okay, I agree. Hmm. All right, we're doing great here. Next question. Um, for consolidation after reaching remission after relapse, is haploidentical stem cell transplantation a consideration for study in Europe? So as uh, Kate said, so it's uh, explored. So there are a cool group of patients that have been treated in Germany with this uh, strategy, haplo and uh, dinituximab beta and GD2 afterwards. And the discussion right now is, the, I mean, there are some countries that may recommend that, some others that do not. So, of course, it may be effective. What we don't know if it's better that to continue with the same treatment, because there are some countries that say if the previous treatment is working, why not to try to do a very prolonged time of treatment, like three years? And this is something that may be explored in a clinical trial, but uh, this is on discussion for one year, more than one year. And so far, we are still further discussing. But I think both approaches are feasible, are but we still don't know which is the better one. Great. Um, next question. If a patient is MYC amplified at diagnosis, um, can the MYC N gene ever go away upon relapse? And I would just pose the inverse question as well, using a moderator's prerogative. Yeah, and the, the answer is that, that there are always rare exceptions, but in general, the answer is no. And that that analogy I used earlier about a tree, um, McN amplification, we believe is often the initiating event. And so it's there in all the cells. We do know occasionally that that's not the case. And there is a subset of cells with McN amplification and those without at diagnosis but in general, the MCN amplified cells are the ones that are resistant and sort of take over. Um, I, I know of a handful of cases where MCN amplification was not present in the diagnostic biopsy, but then is present at relapse. And that's almost certainly because where we biopsied the tumor is not where um, uh, the truncal event started and, and the MCN amplification took over. So I hope that explanation uh, makes sense. Yeah, it certainly does to me, John. Thank you. All right, question number nine. In your honest opinion, do you know if the child will not relapse or has a good chance not to? If so, what do you factor in um, that this child will do well and what factors are critical to not relapse? I, I hope that question makes sense to folks, a challenging one. I, the, um, we try to form an opinion when we meet the child and with the gather we, with the data that we gather at diagnosis, both about the age and the stage and all of those things that are easily measured as well as the genetic studies. Um, but the most important prognostic factor is how the child responds. And, um, and so that's why it's a continuum and needs to continuously be reevaluated. Um, but you know, this, this, we don't need to tell you, this is a sinister disease. So we have, you have probably seen, there are some cases where we think all of the right prognostic factors are there and the child goes into a deep remission early on and suffers a relapse later. 
um, and, and vice versa, where the initial response isn't great, but then uh, intervention is made such as chemoimmunotherapy and they go into a deep remission and are cured. Um, so as Gavin said, this is a very difficult question. And, and um, my honest opinion is that as much as we um, want to be sure about the ultimate outcome, um, none of us in this panel can be at any one point in time, but that means that we need to work with the families to be proactive in, in searching for um, uh, prognostic factors as the course of the therapy goes on. Thank you, John. I'm going to try to combine the next two questions here. They're about biopsies. The first one is um, if uh, biopsy uh, at relapse, bony lesion, not soft tissue sample, was not a viable sample for genetic sequencing, then what? Would liquid biopsy still be an option, even though there have been several treatment cycles completed? And then the, the additional question here that's related, I think, is if your hospital doesn't do liquid biopsies, what can you do? So I think it's, as we said before, so in the case of a liquid biopsy, the so this, the closer to the time of relapse or progression, the higher the possibility to find something in that liquid biopsy. So it's better. So for me, the possibility is to find something is lower if the patient is already responding to chemotherapy, but can be done also. But the, the timing, it's, it's very important. And uh, I think that even if the hospital doesn't that, do it. There are some other hospitals to which the samples can be referred of the patients, at least in Europe. And for example, we work with reference labs in Europe. And sometimes even if it's a small lab, it's not used to do that. It can be sent to another lab that can perform it. And there are commercial, um, you know, there are companies that would do this in, and um, the adult panels are perfectly fine for um, childhood cancers. And so companies like Foundation Medicine, you know, you can ship blood to them from anywhere around the world. All right. Um, this next one, I'm sure we could talk about for a while, but I'll ask folks just to kind of give your, your best summary answer. And the question is, what are the strategies in COG and SIAPIN to identify the best relapse regimen? I, th I think our, our approach in the children's oncology group is to take drugs that have shown activity in at least one patient in, in phase one dose escalation trials. And of course they would have had a rationale to be tested there. And then we try to test them in a randomized fashion. Our, our strategy lately has been doing phase two trials where we test a known uh, regimen against the ex more experimental regimen or sometimes, uh, as in our prior immunotherapy regimen with the rinotecan, um, temozolomide, and dinatuximab, we tested it against the same chemotherapy with serolimus, um, which we would have thought would have been acti active based on uh, the genetic targets. And then we found that the immunotherapy, immunochemotherapy, was the best regimen. But Generally, our approach has been to take uh, two regimens and compare them in relapse patients. So in Europe, it's the same strategy as uh, Kate uh, said. So it's the beacon trial, the wrist trial, so combining chemotherapy and adding on top or with abisumab or dinituximab uh, beta or some other uh, drugs. And the only thing that I would add to that is, you know, that that's how we've been going for a long time. And what many of us are really hoping for is the leukemia CART-19 example in neuroblastoma where there's a breakthrough therapy that can quickly move into the front line. And exactly. um, that's been elusive, um, but I'm hopeful that uh, one of those therapies will be um, developed soon. And, and I think we're also, uh, as the approach in the MAPIAC study, we hope we'll have a good basket trial if we have enough options to offer for neuroblastoma where the tumor is tested and then assigned to a treatment that targets the specific defects. Yeah. But I think it's uh, sometimes a bit different if we are talking about the first relapse, which is more like a beacon strategy or 
what right. we have discussed, if it's a second or further relapses in which you have already used what you think is the best for the first relapse, and then you are looking a bit more based on the biology of the tumor. Yes. Very good. Um, John, the next one's addressed directly to you. Um, do you think one day in the future it will be possible to predict which patients may relapse based on the information of disease at diagnosis and advances in understanding neuroblastoma? Yeah, well, I'm a cup half full guy and I'm optimistic about many things. I, I don't think that we're ever going to have, at least in my lifetime, um, a foolproof, this patient will never relapse based upon our what we can learn at diagnosis. Um, cancer is just too complex and too, um, the ability of the cancer to evolve very quickly when exposed to chemotherapy or radiation therapy is just, just really, really tricky. And um, so that's why, although I've spent a lot of my career looking at prognostic markers at diagnosis, we've sort of shifted to continuing to monitor prognostic factors over the course of therapy. And I think that's where the future is. Thank you. We're doing great here. I think we're halfway through. Let's keep going. Um, the next question is about uh, biopsy again. Presenters are stressing the importance of biopsy at relapse. What to do if a bone relapse, a liquid biopsy, a uh, liquid biopsy panel for neuroblastoma or childhood cancer in general is not developed compared to adult cancers, any work in this area? I think we touched I, I, on this already, but you know, maybe- Yeah, a I mean, just to reemphasize, I, I think that, um, First of all, we spent a lot of time and, you know, I showed that manuscript that maybe your, you know, your docs could refer to. And I think there's a lot of experience in Europe as well is that a bone relapse is generally very, unless it's in a growth plate or a really sensitive area, most bone relapses can be safely biopsied, whether it's the skull or, or an arm or a leg or the pelvis, um, the, the ability to use um, CAT scans um, or ultrasound to guide the needle into the right spot is really pretty amazing these days. And I think, again, this is part of the disparity in the world. At, at, the, at the resource-rich centers, this, this can be done. Um, we are developing, um, both in Europe and in the U.S., um, neuroblastoma-specific uh, liquid biopsy panels. But the good news is that the uh, the ones that have, at least, uh, uh, Pablo will have to speak to this, but at least um, for us in the United States, and it's really worldwide, you know, we were consulted when Foundation Medicine made their liquid biopsy panel. And so we were able to get very important um, mm -hmm. pediatric and neuroblastoma specific things on that panel, at least. So mm -hmm. we, we currently use the Foundation Medicine liquid biopsy panel for all of our patients at CHOP while we're developing our own. So it depends in Europe, but in some centers it's also used. So, but, but as you said, yeah, apart from the specific panels, there are some good uh, adult panels that can be used. But I think what it's important also is that uh, not by having a lot of alterations at the time of relapse, does it mean that we can treat them or that we know how to treat them? So for me, we have a good example of ALK, which is something that we cannot miss at the time of relapse. But there are some other targets for which we don't really know if uh, there is an available treatment, even in the list that I show, those are things that are being explored, but we don't really know if they work in all the patients or in the patients as we plan. So I think that uh, this is also important. So we have to give, so it's important to do the biopsy. It's important to test ALK and other targets if feasible, not, uh, I mean, ALK is of mandatory, but the others we have to be careful also for me. Thank you very much. Um, okay, moving on here. Next question, is the point of relapse relevant to prognosis um, or the aggressiveness of disease? For example, relapsing during frontline treatment protocol versus after treatment is completed, two years post-treatment, five years post-treatment, et cetera. I think uh, one thing we've found is, is that Children who relapse um, 
generally have a shorter time to progression than children who have refractory disease. So the relapse indicates that something's proliferating faster, I think. And those, the, if that's what the question is asking is, is uh, how long the second remission will be. I think with refractory disease, I've seen children can go on for a long time. Uh, but the time to progression is shorter in someone who has an actual relapse, even if it's later. John or Pablo, anything to add to that? Uh, it, it's a tough question. Um, the um, And again, depends upon the context. And, you know, we've had very good results for children, the older children, um, especially those who have um, a mutation in that gene ATRX, where you know the MIBG is has 23 spots at diagnosis, they go through the standard induction chemotherapy, and they still have 23 spots. Um, that instead of going right to, tra to transplant, which is the U.S. strategy, a European strategy, um, we introduce chemoimmunotherapy, and many of those patients will go into re remission. Um, on the other hand, if if that same story is happening in a toddler who has MCAN amplified disease. That's a much more difficult situation. Um, and we really need new approaches for that child. Understood. Okay, I think this next one we touched on earlier a little bit too, but I'll, I'll ask in case folks have anything else to add. Um, relapse versus refractory regimens. How are these regimens decided and do they differ in COG and Cyathin? I mean, I do do think we talked about this, that that both COG and Syapin have a, method, a, a methodological approach to try to bring in new regimens based upon evidence from early phase clinical trials. Um, and we meet with our European colleagues all the time to make sure that we're not doing the exact same thing. It, it's, it's very good that we try different things because it probably does not feel like it on the Zoom, but it is a relatively rare condition, so we can't test everything. Um, but many of us are also looking for those breakthrough therapies that we hope would jump to the front of the line of refractory and relapse um, um, therapies. Yep. All right, the next question is about mutations. Um, are some genetic mutations more risky for relapse and hence a worse outcome, or don't we know? Yeah, I think that was the very first question that we had, and I hope I addressed it there. The bottom line is they're all important um, in what, um, and they, um, there's, no, there's no one that trumps another in terms of risk for relapse. What we're really focused on now is how to monitor because if a therapy is working, any therapy is working, those mutations that you can detect in the blood should be should go away and stay away and um, how to match those mutations to specific therapies because every mutation would have a different way to try to turn it off. Yep. All right. The next one um, is directed at you, Kate, and it's about MIBG. Do we have a clear view of the MIG therapy risk for secondary malignancies? And how is it explained uh, that while the same target works for imaging on a child, the same kid doesn't respond to MIBG therapy? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, in, in terms of the risk of secondary malignancy, we studied that in, in the patients we saw at UC over many, many years. And we found that the, and those were all patients who had relapsed and had multiple treatments, most of them including transplant as well. And the risk of second malignancy in those children was about 7% at five years and 14% at 10 years. So it was certainly significant. Most of those secondary malignancies were leukemias, though a few had uh, thyroid cancer. The, but when you look at the secondary malignancy rate after transplant in patients who have not had MIBG therapy, it was very close to that in some studies in patients who'd been transplanted. So it's difficult to tease out how much MIBG contributed, though you would certainly 
be suspicious because it's known that radiation can predispose. I think we'll get a better answer from our upfront study in the children's oncology group where children are getting comparable amounts of therapy other than the MIBG and they're getting it up front. And we will see if it truly makes a difference. In terms of why some children respond, I would love to know the answer to that. It, it must have to do with the resistance of their tumors to radiation, because if they take up the MIBG and we know that the radiation dose given by MIBG into tumors can sometimes be four or five or 10 times higher than what you can give externally. But those tumors are probably resistant to everything, uh, at least all cytotoxic agents, including radiation. So that's why we are looking much harder for combination therapy with MIBG, combining it with antibody, combining it with varinostat, uh, or even with other chemotherapy. So we find other ways to attack that tumor. Very good. And let's, if we could stick with you, Kate, the next one's on MIBG as well. Um, is MIBG therapy a good option for targeting liver metastases and hybris neuroblastoma stage four? I don't have a, a large study of that to quote because uh, liver metastases are certainly less frequent uh, than our bone and bone marrow in, in relapsed patients. I can say that I've treated children with liver metastases and seen dramatic responses. I don't know why they would respond, uh, but that's all I, I can say. Maybe, John, you have... Or no, I, I mean, uh, the experience like yours is more anecdotal, but, you know, definitely have had patients with significant liver metastases uh, show a good response, just like you said. Gavin, did you miss the question about uh, the uh, if there's MIBG AVID and non-AVID, whether you would give MIBG therapy? Question 19. Um, the answer is no. I, yeah, I, at least I do not, I, I do not yeah. give MIBG therapy if there is clearly active disease that is non-MIBG AVID. And that has been my practice. Though now I wonder again if you could give a mixture of therapies to such a patient with MIBG and other agents. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. I think question 18 just before kind of touched on that point too. So glad we circled back here. Um, and I think fingers crossed we're going to get all these questions in if we keep going. So let's. Uh, Let's go to the next one. Uh, liquid biopsies um, continue to be a big topic of interest, which is great. This question um, is on that subject. Can you do a liquid tumor biopsy once in remission to detect mutations or does there have to be evidence of disease? So the best result on a liquid biopsy is that no mutations are detected, which is consistent with the child being in remission. So it's my practice for patients who are in remission but very high risk for relapse to do a liquid biopsy in between their standard imaging and we have we haven't published this yet but um, we have you know multiple cases where the liquid biopsy has shown micken amplification or another mutation that we knew about used to be there shows up in the liquid biopsy at very low levels while the child feels completely fine in the last scan six weeks ago was negative. And then we bring them back and, and have um, proved that the scan is now positive, but get it at a state where there's very minimal disease. Whether we're gonna be able to use that to improve their outcomes, we don't know yet. Um, but um, we think it's a very, for the, any of you who have friends who are in the leukemia world, they've been doing this forever, which is they call it MRD, minimal residual disease, ways to look if there's microscopic or submicroscopic disease. And that's what we're trying to achieve with these liquid biopsies. But I think that it's important. So as we said, so there are liquid biopsies at the time of a relapse, for example, to try to identify targets that can be done in case of there is no biopsy that can be done or that a uh, can be better reflect the complexity of the tumor. So this is something. And then the time of uh, following up of the, of the patients afterwards, that is also done, for example, in Sajepen, but it's more for research. And so far, it doesn't change the follow-up of the patients that continue with the regular follow-up. 
Thanks to both of you. Um, the next one's for you, John. Uh, when does relapse usually occur and when do the percentages go down of the chance of relapse? I think Kate explained that very well earlier, um, that uh, children are at high risk for relapse during their therapy and for that first year off of therapy and then the risk for relapse goes down, down, down. And the very, very frustrating thing is no one can say when is the risk of relapse zero. Um, because all of us in the panel have seen the rare cases where the relapse occurs at 10 or 12 or 14 years. But the vast majority, as Kate said, occur um, on therapy or in the first two years off of therapy. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, is there ever a reason to try a drug that targets mutation, even if it is unknown if the child has that mutation? especially in the case of second, third relapse situations where a biopsy was not able to be done? That's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question and it's a tough question. Um, so theoretically, yes. If, if there are no you know, good options, you know, why not try an ALK inhibitor? Um, what I would say, at least in my institution, um, we generally can get the data to support that um, either biopsying something through um, with our interventional radiologist or with a liquid biopsy. Um, and you know, the, the, you hate to have this practical stuff stand in the way, um, but often, at least in the United States, access to that drug is tied to being able to prove that the mutation's there. Um, so, I've never tried to get a drug for when we didn't have evidence of the mutation, um, but I understand why you're asking the question. And I think that if um, knowing that about a third of kids at relapse have an ALK mutation and no way to prove it, 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 it would not be unreasonable on my, my mind because of the risk benefit ratio to try the ALK inhibitor. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, I don't agree with that, John, <laughs> because I think that for me, it's important to uh, identify a target. I mean, it depends on what you consider target therapy. So there are targets like uh, therapies like ALK inhibitors that uh, only work if you have the alteration. And there are some others that target many things, even if we call them target therapies. So those that target many things, uh, why not? Cell cycle inhibitors combined with, with chemotherapy. But for me, there is no reason to give a patient an ALK inhibitor in the absence of proven ALK mutation or ALK amplification in, in that case. Taking into account that what we know is that the probability to have an ALK mutation is low at the time of relapse, 15% or 20. And even the responses are not so amazing, even we have been good responses in this type of patients. But also that we may have some other options that for these patients without ALK alterations could be better. So at least in the Salupen uh, point of view, we wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not disagreeing, Pablo. I, what I, the tone I got from the question was if there's no other options, and maybe I was over reading the tone. Um, you know, in general, is I think I put, you know, got through, we are all about evidence-based therapy, and, and that's what we should seek. But when there are no options, we often try to innovate in different ways. But sometimes saying a tr it's not really a treatment, I mean, even these drugs, you said low risk, but they do have side effects. They do cause fatigue. They, they can cause psych psychiatric side effects. I mean, there, there are many other side effects of these so-called targeted drugs. And I personally don't like to use a drug without uh, a rationale. <laughs> yeah. All right, that was a good discussion. Thank, thanks to all of you. I think if we hurry, we can get these last few in here. Um, the next one is regarding um, NMIC amplification. The question is, is the legacy view for MIC amplification still true, uh, meaning that NMIC amplified high-risk patients have worse prognosis even in the era of antibodies? I think that the, uh, the, the player um, high-dose chemotherapy has made the most is justified the most is in children with endemic amplified disease because they're so they're so aggressive that chemotherapy works. 
Um, and I think that in the era of intensive chemotherapy, the bad prognostic um, in a population of patients, it, 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 it's equal, uh, the outcome is equal whether you have endic amplification or not. Um, but it is a very important biomarker to have, as I try to emphasize, because we know that if the disease does relapse, it's going to behave differently than patients whose tumors do not have that um, uh, aberration. Yep. Thank you, John. Um, Laura, we've got a question for you here. What do you think about the concept of false hope? I often hear that it is important not to give parents caregivers false hope when their child relapses. Should care teams be concerned about false hope? You know, Gavin, I have a memory from talking to another mother when we were going through, I don't know if it was the third or fourth relapse, you know, for third or fourth relapse. And there was not a lot of reason to have a lot of hope, but yet it, that's how I could not help but orient myself. And I remember asking another mom as we refer to angel mom, so someone who had lost her child. And I just said, hey, do you think I should kind of give myself a reality check here? You know, should I prep myself if, if we should lose Hans? Because really, guys, that was not on my radar, you know. And my friend said, no, you're okay. You're okay. You know, and, and I think that little memory is so telling to me um, because I think that hope is a fuel. And like I said in my talk, it doesn't, it, it can't betray you. You know, it, it doesn't give you any promises, but it's not going to betray you. So I remember that conversation I had with my girlfriend and it was, it was powerful to me then. And that's, that's how I feel. What do you think, Gavin? I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to agree completely with what you said. I mean, there are there are very dark days for some of us where hope is all you have. If you lose that, then I don't know what you do. So um, I appreciate the question, but um, I think if you lose hope, then um, your child knows it and it just makes everything that much more difficult. So as challenging as it is, I think you have to find a way to be optimistic. Um, and that's easier said than done, but that that would be my um, advice. All right, um, I got a helpful note here from the organizers um, with respect to the previous DFMO vaccine question, um, and that is um, a request that I uh, remind folks that those can be posed um, uh, during the maintenance session tomorrow uh, as well. Uh, all right, let's keep going here. Uh, next question is, uh, let me just read it here. Having an 11Q deletion, you mentioned a relapse years later. So I guess this is on the question of perhaps this deletion predisposing patients to relapsing late. Um, uh, do you expect a child with 11Q deletion to have a greater risk of relapse? And I think Kate, that one's for you. Yes, I, I mean, I think the answer is any segmental chromosome abnormality, 1P deletion, 11Q deletion, 6Q, uh, all of these carry a higher risk of relapse. But I would say, you know, we, we discovered that 15 years ago. Uh, the, for the children with, with non-high risk disease, um, it's very clear that 1P and 11Q are associated with a higher risk of relapse. Within the group that have high risk disease, it's sort of like MICN. Um, it, 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 on a population level, it does not mean that they're going to, they're, there's a higher likelihood of relapse. Um, again, it, everything is associations and Kate is absolutely right that the children with 11Q deletion often are older patients with a more indolent form disease that are, if they are going to have a relapse, it tends to be the later relapse. Um, so, um, you know, if you're a younger child with an 11Q deletion and, and no ATRX mutation, um, then the, uh, there, it, you're not at risk for a later relapse. Thank you, John and, and Kate. 
The next one's interesting. Um, is it a question of funding for research to find a cure or is it, or is the disease too complex and money doesn't matter to crack a cure? The disease is too complex. A lot of research is needed to improve what we do. I think this is the, the reply for me. So it's too complex. It's not just a problem of money, but uh, without uh, funding to be able to do the research that we need to do, for example, we were discussing before if we can identify patients that are not just high risk, but ultra high risk. So we need to continue improving what we do and really research is the only way to improve. Yeah, it's a complex disease, but we need money. And, um, you know, I think that it is, it is, um, th there's great technology now that can be applied, but it's very expensive technology and the kind of clinical trials that we really need to crack a cure are gonna be very complicated immunotherapy, cellular therapies that are very, very expensive. Um, so funding is very, very important. Yeah, yeah I think you might have skipped question 30. Yeah, and I'm gonna go back, John, but you know, I'll just Sorry. weigh in on that one quickly as an advocate. I, I think the amount of money we dedicate to pediatric cancer research in the US is woefully inadequate. Um, and, you know, everybody on this uh, meeting knows that cancer is the leading cause of death in kids and the percentage that, you know, we're allocating to pediatric research um, uh, is, is embarrassing, quite frankly. Um, and I, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Washington Post just a few weeks ago that got published highlighting that fact. And I know it's apples to oranges, but I think about the money that's been invested, thank goodness, um, in vaccines for COVID. Um, and look in less than a year what's been produced um, to make life better for folks around the world. You know, I wonder what kind of progress these wonderful folks who are talking with us today could make with that kind of money. And I, I'd put my bet on, a, if not a cure, a much better uh, set of treatments that are less toxic and more efficacious if we have that kind of investment. So thanks for letting me get on my soapbox there. No, no, it was a great letter, Gavin. Thank you. Uh, question 30, should relapse treatment be different if you have no, um, if you have no or soft tissue relapse? So I think that, um, I'm not exactly sure what the question is saying, but I, I think that the, the big thing that's different for me in the relapse setting is whether the relapse is at a single site or multiple sites. And so um, I think that in general, radiation doesn't have a huge role in the relapse setting except for helping with painful lesions. Um, but in, if it's just a single site and you're very sure of that and the therapy makes, you know, there's a response, um, we tend to try to consolidate that with radiation to that single site. Thanks, John. Um, we're in the home stretch here, and I want to thank the organizers for letting us go a little over to keep this discussion going. A lot of really important questions. Um, uh, and the next one is, why do kids relapse after five years? We use five years to say cured, but we see kids, kids relapse after eight years. Do we need to monitor for 10 years to be safe? And I think we talked about this earlier, so I don't know if others, you know, want to chime in with additional thoughts. Um, but I just, just want to, to make a comment because, for example, so I don't know what's the type of monitor that you do in US, but for example, in Sajapen, after five years, it's once per year, medical visit only with the echography, abdominal echography and urine catecholamines. So as Kate said, so the risk is very, very low. And it's also important. So at that time, where it's most important, more than the medical visit and the echography on urinary catecholamines, is how the kid's doing. So this is the... Unfortunately, there is no way to. Yeah. Um, thank you, Pablo. Um, uh, next question, should relapse treatment be different if you have bone versus soft tissue relapse? Yeah, I think we just addressed that. It, 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 it really, the answer is no, unless you only have a single bone site or a single soft tissue site. Great. And then the last question, number 34, I can't believe we got through all these, it's great. Um, is age a risk for relapse? Again, I think we touched on this. Is age a risk for relapse? Um, example, two-year-old versus four-year-old versus six-year-old when diagnosed. We know that if children, have, uh, of all neuroblastoma patients, um, 
children over 18 months of age have a higher risk of relapse. Um, but uh, for children with high risk disease, age is, is a very poor prognostic marker. And there, again, it's associated, you know, the older kids have slower disease, the younger kids have more rapid disease, but both can relapse. Well, all right, let me stop here. Um, we got through all the questions. Um, and let me again, thank this wonderful panel of experts for their insight and their time. Um, we're very fortunate to have them with us today. I also wanna thank every one of the participants um, uh, for their attention and for their great questions. And I too also wanna thank the charities and the sponsors of this just wonderful global symposium um, and also the staff behind the scenes who've made this all work so seamlessly. Thanks to everybody. Uh, up next at 8.45 Greenwich Mean Time is a special interest talk on progress in neuroblastoma clinical trials. And uh, everyone should remember that if you miss a session, it will be available on demand uh, right here on the event platform. And you'll be notified uh, when those sessions become available. Thanks again to everybody. And uh, we'll see you so in the next much. session. Thank you. Thank you.